Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that in this hour your word to be spoken and heard, that you'd place upon my lips what you desire to be revealed, and that you'd open all of our hearts to the power and truth contained in your teaching, that through this you would transform us into the disciples that you desire us to be. We pray this in the holy and precious name of Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. He is risen. Oh, good. You, some of you remember, at least, right? Yeah. So let me ask you a question. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, would you be here this morning? Yeah. Some people might show up for the donuts, but you really get a better selection down the street, right? But yeah, I mean, if, if he didn't rise from the dead, I, I, I got to ask, why would you be here? I mean, what would be the point? What possible reason could you have, right? You see, there's something unique about Christianity. It's different than all the other religions in the world, as far as I can tell. All the other religions are based upon uh, teachings of their leaders, right, that are passed down through their disciples, and, and they learn from those teachings, and they try to emulate that in their life and that type of thing. We have some of that in Christianity, but Christianity is different in that its very foundation, its very backbone is based upon a historical reality. The historical reality is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if that had not happened, then we really have no reason to worship, no reason for faith, no reason for even being here, right? St. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter. He says, if Christ had not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we're then found to be false witnesses about God, because we've testified that God raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised, if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith, it's futile, and you're still in your sins. And then those, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who believed in him as they died, they're lost. If only in this life you have hope in Christ, in other words, if all you're doing is just following the teachings of Jesus in this life, then, then you are most to be pitied. But, Paul says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, something kind of interesting at the end of, of chapter 20 that Julie read in the Gospel of John, um, and, and you kind of lose it, I think, unless you're reading the whole gospel, and, and the entire gospel, John is just telling the story. He's telling the story about Jesus. He's revealing uh, what Jesus did, the miracles and everything, his death and resurrection. And in chapter 20, and we heard it this morning, in the gospel of John, he does something. He, he stops telling the story. And it's like he puts down his pen, and he looks away from his script, and he looks at all of us. And he says this, I'm writing these things down so that you may believe and have life. That's extraordinary, I think. So let's, let's look again at what John is writing, what John is telling. Um, this, this section that was read this morning, there's so much in there, I'm not going to touch it all. I'm just going to hit certain spots. First of all, it starts out, telling us that the disciples are hiding, they're in a room, and the doors are locked. And it tells us the reason why the doors are locked. It says, uh, nice translations say, for fear of the Jews, right? Isn't that so nice? Nice, sweet. The, the, the word literally can mean they are terrified. They are scared to death. They're immovable because they're so afraid, Right? And you might say, well, why? Well, well, just think, right? Think of the brutality of Jesus' beatings. Any of you have ever seen uh, The Passion of the Christ, Mel, uh, Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, get those images in your head, right? Some of them saw those images, right? Uh, they, they're still reeling from the hatred of the mob that could, could yell out, crucify, crucify, right? Now, they're scared of the, the vicious political maneuvering of the Jewish leadership, right? The cold and calculated, right? Uh, the cold, heartless, mechanical crucifixion carried out by the Romans, right? That's, that's, and now, now, the body's missing, right? This is the evening of the resurrection where this is told, and the body is missing, right? 
That's how Jesus found his disciples that evening. They knew he'd been crucified. Some of them were actually there, saw it happen, right? And, 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 and now they've heard the, the testimony of the women, but ladies, don't throw rotten fruit at me. The testimony of women back then was not considered anything reliable. And before you get angry at me, just read uh, Flavius Josephus, Jewish historian. He validates this point, right? And so they're, they're confused. They're, they're skeptical. They're, they're wondering what in the world is going on, right? And, and they're terrified. They don't know what to do next. They are scared to death. And then... Jesus appears right in their midst. Locked doors, Jesus appears in their midst, right? That adds to their fear, their terror, their confusion, right? And what are the first words Jesus says? Peace be with you, right? Peace be with you. That's so nice, right? Jesus says, peace be with you, right? He's literally saying, you know, I'm coming here and, and, and I'm coming in the midst of all your terror, and I'm bringing you harmony and tranquility. I'm bringing you safety and welfare. I'm bringing you health in, in Aramaic and in Hebrew, the word shalom. I'm, I'm bringing you perfection. I'm come bringing you completion, right? So then he shows the, the wounds in his hands and the wound in his side to the disciples, and, and they, they fall down and worship him, right? And now what's their emotion? They're over crazy joyful, right? So they go from terrified, right? And now they're just like, ah, Jesus, I'm doing their cartwheels, all kinds of stuff, right? And, and Jesus over here says, peace. Over here, right after that, I just love this, right after the, it says that they were overcome with joy, Jesus says, again, peace be with you. I think it should be translated different. I think he should say, calm down, Calm down, don't be terrified, it's just me. And now, yeah, calm down, calm down, peace, peace, settle down, because you need to pay attention. You need to understand what my death and resurrection are all about. You need to understand what comes next. As I have been sent, now God is gonna send you, right? Now, if I'm honest, there are times that, that I've thought, you know, man, if I'd only been there, you know, just think what my faith would be. If, if I saw Jesus, if I, could, if I could do what the disciples did, you know, and touch him and hold him, man, just think what my faith would be, right? <laughs> I'd probably be just as bad, right? Because we're all human, right? And this is an extraordinary event. This doesn't make any sense. This is, this is so outside the normal realm of things. These guys don't know what to do with it. As a matter of fact, one of them wasn't there, right? Good old Thomas. Can you imagine poor Thomas? For the rest of eternity, he's called Doubting Thomas, right? All the others doubted, but he gets the moniker, right? So Larry, how would you like Doubting Larry the rest of your life? Everybody, there's Doubting Larry, right? I mean, that'd be awful. That'd be horrible, right? But we're all in that same category. We understand where Thomas is coming from, right? We all have those doubts. We all have those struggles. For believers in Christ, faith means trusting Christ in everything. It means for God's Holy Spirit to bring us into a belief in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross through the teaching of God's Holy Spirit, through his word, right? Through a genuine life of gratitude for what he's done. It, it, means, up, it means giving any hope of winning God's favor by anything that we do. It means, it means seeking Jesus above everything else. It means in our darkest times, when we're terrified, that he brings us peace that passes all understanding. And, and when life is crazy good and we have uncontrollable joy, Christ brings that, that same peace and calms us. Where in all situations, we can focus upon him, his will, and his word. In the 31st Psalm, Starting with the 14th verse, it says, but I'm trusting you, O Lord. That's another way of saying I have faith in you, Lord. I believe in you, Lord, saying you are my God. There's no other. 
You are my God. My future is in your hands. Pastor Lewis loves to say, people plan and God laughs. <laughs> That's so true. We, we like to plan, we like to think we got a plan, and there's all kinds of curves and all kinds of things come crashing in, right? In John 20, verse 29, it says this, Jesus then told him, this is to Thomas, but it's also to us, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about all of us. He's talking about you. He's talking about me, right? He's talking about that faith that comes. And when that faith comes to believe what you can't see, when you can't touch Jesus, that's why he calls that relationship blessed. It only happens by the blessing of God. So I want to ask you an honest question. Do you ever feel like Thomas? Where you kind of go, well, you know, I believe, but ah, there's those times that I just, mm, just doesn't quite come together, huh? Well, I, I want you to know something. This may shock you. You can talk to God about that. <laughs> he actually invites you to talk to him about that, to engage him in prayer and, and, and to, to lift up your doubts, right? And, and to say, Lord, I, I need your help. I, I need your Holy Spirit. And, and when God's Holy Spirit comes, uh, allow it to speak to you through the Scriptures. Uh, allow it to speak to you through even sermons. <laughs> allow it to, to speak to you through small groups that you're in and Christian friends that you have. Allow it to speak to you through prayer. If you're having doubts, I would love to spend time with you. Go have a cup of coffee together and, and, and to, to, to talk about faith and life and, and all those things and, and how it comes together. Paul says, you know, Thomas wasn't the only one that had doubts. Now, there were others in the early church, uh, they weren't so sure about this resurrection thing. And so he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, he says this, for what I received, and, and a lot of scholars believe that he received this probably from Peter and, and possibly James, um, and, and, and what he's going to reveal is the most important thing, right? He says, for what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance. So he says, I don't care if you learn anything else, learn this. I don't care if you remember anything else from this sermon, hear this. And this isn't my words, these are, these are Paul's words, okay? He says, this is the most important thing, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. So Paul is verifying this very story that we heard uh, re recorded in the Gospel of John, that Jesus appeared to Peter and to the twelve. Huh? After that, Paul says, I love this, Paul says, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. I think if Paul had written that today, he would have said, um, I got 500 names of eyewitnesses. Uh, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe the, the 12, I got 500 names. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll email you the spreadsheet, and you can look it over. You can get their phone numbers and, their, and text them, right, and find out uh, what they know about this, right? Uh, 500, right? Um, you, can, you can go have coffee with them, sit down and, and talk about this resurrection thing. And, and, and I got 500 names. I actually have more than 500 names. How many do you want, right? I mean, that's a lot of names. That's a lot of eyewitnesses to an event, right? Then he appeared to James. We've talked about this before, right? You know who James was, right? Jesus' half-brother, Right? And he became a leader of the early church, right? And you're all going, well, of course. He's part of the family. You know, that's what families do. Uh, he becomes the head of the church, right? I'm an only kid, so I need to depend upon some of you guys' expertise. How many of you have a brother? Okay. How many of you, if your brother came to you and said, I am the Savior of the world, the Son of God, the Redeemer of of everyone. How many of you would go, yeah. yeah? Look at all those hands go up, right? You'd be going, 
um, you are loonier than I thought you were yesterday, right? You'd, you'd be really skeptical. Guess what? That was James's reaction. We have uh, reference earlier in Scripture, James and the other brothers, and even Mary herself, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, you know, you're sounding kind of crazy, right? Um, this Son of God stuff, uh, it's not really playing well. People are laughing at the family. Um, why don't you come with us, Jesus? We'll take you home. We'll fix you a nice cup of tea and lock you in a padded cell, right? You are loony bins, right? So, I got to ask all of you that got brothers, what, what in the world could possibly happen that might change your mind where you would go, huh, maybe he is the savior of the world? In James's case, I believe it was encountering the resurrected Jesus. Changed everything for James. Paul goes on, he says, then to the, all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as one who's abnormally born. They don't really know how to translate that word abnormally. It just kind of means I was born at the wrong time. I, I, didn't, I was born too late, didn't make the cut of the original 12, uh, and I'm kind of a late comer, right? He says, I don't even de really deserve to be called an apostle. Right? He says, you know, I, I, didn't, I wasn't with the original 12, all this stuff, right? And I, don't, and I really don't deserve to be called an apostle. I don't be, I deserve to be called one that, that shares the gospel. And then he says, why? He says, because I persecuted the church. This guy, who's writing all this stuff, earlier hated the church. Anybody that called themselves a Christian, he wanted them silenced, he wanted them arrested, he wanted them thrown in prison, he wanted them killed so that they could never say another word. The best way uh, to deal with this Christian problem was to kill all the Christians. He wanted the church destroyed, wanted everything burned down, he wanted people, he hated Jesus. Now you tell me, what could change a person like that with such hatred and, and really a terroristic uh, personality? What could change them on a dime to go from reviling and hating the church to becoming its greatest missionary and chief theologian? He tells us, I encountered the resurrected Christ. Now, the same thing can be said of these terrified and then joyful disciples described in John's gospel, right? What do they do? After they encounter the resurrected Christ, they go to their death, proclaiming the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as a reality. N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, says this. He says, as a historian... I look at all the details and he says, I cannot explain the rise of the early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. N.T. Wright says, you can't explain Christianity unless Jesus rose from the dead. Now think about this. I mean, just put your thinking caps on for a little bit. People will die for a lie that they believe is true, right? Right? I mean, people do that all the time. Um, I think a lot of terrorists do that. They will die for a lie that they have been told is true, right? These disciples, they knew whether Jesus rose or not. They knew it, right? They knew if they actually encountered the resurrected Jesus or not. People will die for a lie that they think is true, but people will not die for a lie that they know is a lie. There is no way to explain why these 10 individuals would go to their martyred, crucified, tortured deaths unless they believed that Jesus rose from the dead because they encountered the resurrected Christ. That's the only explanation that makes any sense. And if you reject the resurrection, you are left with an inexplicable mystery 
You have to explain an empty tomb. You have to explain the transformations, the reports of the appearances, and the rise of the church. The evidence, guys, the evidence is so powerful for the resurrection of Jesus that one of the world's leading Jewish theologians, a guy by the name of Pinchas Lapid, I mean, who would name their kid that, but they did, right? Pinchas Lapid taught at Hebrew University in Israel. He declared himself so convinced on the basis of all the evidence, he wrote a book. He wrote a book, and in that book, he declared that the God of Israel raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. But he's not a Christian. He doesn't believe that Jesus is his Messiah. He believes in the historical reality of the death and resurrection of Christ. So here's the next step. Intellectual agreement with the resurrection as being historically real does not equate belief. Belief implies trust, hope, and confidence in the why of the resurrection. Martin Luther wrote this. He said, faith is a living and daring confidence in God's grace so sure, so certain that a person would stake their lives on it a thousand times. Immovable in their faith, right? And the resurrection, the resurrection, historically true, I believe it's absolutely historically true. As crazy as it is, it's historically true. The resurrection proves that the claims of Jesus, that the ones he made about himself, also are true. And what did he claim? He claimed to be God. Now it's impossible, guys, it's impossible to get around the fact that Jesus claimed that he was God. Now, if Jesus had stayed dead in the tomb, I think it'd be foolish to believe those claims that Jesus said about himself being God, right? But since he rose from the dead like he said he would, like he prophesied he would, it would be foolish not to believe his claims about himself. The resurrection, for me, proves that Jesus, what he said about himself, is true, that he is fully God and fully man. Makes my brain hurt, but I believe it with every fiber of my being. Jesus is the only religious leader who has ever risen from the dead. All the other religious leaders, you know where you can find them? In their tombs. Holy places, shrines of their burial. Jesus has none. His is empty. Jesus' resurrection demonstrates that what he said is true. And what did he say? He said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? You see, the New Testament just doesn't tell us that Jesus rose from the dead and leaves us wondering why he did this. The New Testament answers the why that he did this because we are sinners. And because we have sinned, we're deserving of God's judgment. And since God is just, he can't simply let sins go. All debts must be paid. I got a whole other sermon on that. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 4.25, he was delivered up because of our sins. And then he goes on, and he was raised to life for our justification. Paul is saying that Christ's resurrection proves that his mission to conquer sin was successful. That his resurrection proves that he is a Savior who not only is willing, but is able to deliver us on the day of judgment. My friends, don't live Easter with some sort of suspension of disbelief. Live it with the glory of faith. Pray to God that he will continue to work within you, transforming you, and drawing you ever closer to him. 1 Peter 1, verse 8 says, You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. And the reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Guys, this is no joke. This is real. This is real. Do you believe this? Because the salvation of your soul rests 
on that belief. In the precious name of Christ our Lord, amen. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to rain down upon us, to empower us to, to receive your word, to embrace the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and to find in his death our eternal salvation. Fill us with such joy and peace and confidence that we are willing not only to live our lives according to that truth, but to share that with those who are struggling in life in the darkness with no hope. We pray, Heavenly Father, that our eyes would be firmly fixed upon Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and who is our Savior, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen.